This is chapter 10 of Jane Eyre. Hitherto I have recorded in detail the events of my insignificant existence. To the first 10 years of my life, I have given almost as many chapters. But this is not to be a regular autobiography. I am only bound to invoke memory where I know her responses will possess some degree of interest. Therefore, I now pass a space of eight years almost in silence. A few lines only are necessary to keep up the links of connection. So we're reminded again that an older Jane is telling us this narrative. It's supposed to be an autobiography, so a story of her life. We know that um, the Jane Eyre character is completely fictional, and this is not a true autobiography, but it's presented as one. When the typhus fever had fulfilled its mission of devastation at Lowood, it gradually disappeared from thence, but not till its virulence and the number of its victims had drawn public attention on the school. Inquiry was made into the origin of the scourge, and by degrees, various facts came out which excited public indignation in a high degree. The unhealthy nature of the site, the quantity and quality of the children's food, the brackish fetid water used in its preparation, the pupils' wretched, uh, wretched clothing and accommodations, all these things were discovered, and the discovery produced a result mortifying to Mr. Brocklehurst, but beneficial to the institution. Several wealthy and benevolent individuals in the county subscribed largely for the erection of a more convenient building in a better situation. New regulations were made, improvements in diet and clothing introduced, the funds of school were entrusted to the management of a committee. Mr. Brocklehurst, who from his wealth and family connections could not be overlooked, still retained the post of treasurer, but he was aided in the discharge of his duties by gentlemen of rather more enlarged and sympathizing minds. His office of inspector, too, was shared by those who knew how to combine reason with strictness, comfort with economy, compassion with uprightness. The school, thus improved, became in time a truly useful and noble institution. I remained an inmate of its walls after its regeneration for eight years, six as pupil and two as teacher, and in both capacities I bear my testimony to its value and importance." So after this horrible typhus epidemic, um, people wonder, well, what was the cause of all this? Why did this disease um, spread so quickly and have such an awful effect? They find out about the horrible living conditions of the school. Uh, Mr. Brocklehurst is removed from power. He still gets to be treasurer, um, but <laughs> but he's removed from his almost absolute control of the school, and uh, much better people take, take authority. Um, so Jane stays on for six years. There was no real formal education requirements in England in um, this time period, so Jane doesn't have to stay until she's 18. Um, but at 16, she um, has learned most of what she can, and then she spends the next two years there as a teacher. So Jane is 18 at this point in the novel. And she's helped make this place better, probably, by what she's done. So Lowood School has, uh, has reformed for the better. During these eight years, my life was uniform, but not unhappy, because it was not inactive. I had the means of an excellent education placed within my reach, a fondness for some of my studies, and a desire to excel in all, together with a great delight in pleasing my teachers, especially such as I loved, urged me on. I availed myself fully of the advantages offered me. In time I rose to be the first girl of the first class, then I was invested with the office of teacher, which I discharged with zeal for two years. But at the end of that time I altered. Miss Temple, through all changes, had thus far continued superintendent of the seminary. To her instruction I owed the best part of my acquirements. Her friendship and society had been my continual solace. She had stood me in the set of mother, governess, and latterly companion. At this period she married, removed with her husband, a clergyman, an excellent man, almost worthy of such a wife, to a distant county, and consequently was lost to me. So Miss Temple gets married and moves away from Lowood. From the day she left I was no longer the same. With her was gone every settled feeling, every association that had made Lowood in some degree a home to me. I had imbibed from her something of her nature and much of her habits. More harmonious thoughts, what seemed better regulated feelings, had become the inmates of my mind. I had given an allegiance to duty and order. I was quiet, I believed I was content. To the eyes of others, usually even to my own, I appeared a disciplined and subdued character. But destiny, in the shape of the Reverend Mr. Nasmith, came between me and Miss Temple. So that's, that's Miss Temple's husband. I saw her, in her traveling dress, step into a post-chaise, 
Shortly after the marriage ceremony, I watched the chase mount the hill and disappear beyond its brow, and then retire to my own room, and there spent in solitude the greatest part of the half-holiday granted in honor of the occasion. So Miss Temple gets married, uh, leaves, and then Jane just kind of goes upstairs and, and is by herself for a little bit. I walked about the chamber most of the time. I imagined myself only to be regretting my loss and thinking how to repair it. But when my reflections were concluded, and I looked up and found that the afternoon was gone and evening far advanced, another discovery dawned on me, namely, that in the interval I had undergone a transforming process, that my mind had put off all it had borrowed of Miss Temple, or rather that she had taken with her the serene atmosphere I had been breathing in her vicinity, and that now I was left in my natural element and beginning to feel, fear, to feel the stirring of old emotions. It did not seem as if a prop were withdrawn, but rather as if a motive were gone. It was not the power to be tranquil which had failed me, but the reason for tranquility was no more. My world had for some years been in Lowood. My experience had been of its rules and systems. Now I remember that the real world was wide, and that a varied field of hopes and fears, of sensations and excitements, awaited those who had courage to go forth into its expanse to seek real knowledge of life amidst its perils. I went to my window, opened it, and looked out. There were the two wings of the building, there was the garden, there were the skirts of Lowood, there was the hilly horizon. My eye passed all other objects to rest on those most remote, the blue peaks, it was those I longed to surmount. All within their boundary of rock and heath seemed prison ground, exile limits. I traced the white road winding round the base of one mountain and vanishing in a gorge between two. How I longed to follow it farther. I recall the time when I had traveled that very road in a coach. I remember descending that hill at twilight. An age seemed to have elapsed since the day which brought me first to Lowood, and I had never quitted it since. My vacations had all been spent at school. Mrs. Reed had never sent for me to Gateshead. Neither she nor any of her family had ever been to visit me. I had had no communication by letter or message with the outer world. School rules, school duties, school habits and notions, and voices and faces and phrases and costumes and preferences and antipathies, such was what I knew of existence. And now I felt that it was not enough. I tired of the routine of eight years in one afternoon. I desired liberty. For liberty I grasped. For liberty I uttered a prayer. It seemed scattered on the wind, then faintly blowing. I abandoned it and framed a humbler a supplication. For change, stimulus. That petition, too, seemed swept off into vague space. Then I cried, half desperate, grant me at least a new servitude. Here a bell, ringing the hour of supper, called me downstairs. I was not free to resume the interrupted chain of my reflections till bedtime. Even then, a teacher who occupied the same room with me kept me from the subject, which I longed to recur, by a prolonged effusion of small talk. How I wished sleep would silence her. It seemed as if, could I but go back to the idea which had last entered my mind as I stood at the window, some in in inventive suggestion would rise from my relief. Miss Gray snored at last. She was a heavy Welsh woman, and till now her habitual nasal strains had never been regarded by me in any other light than as a nuisance. Tonight I hailed the first deep notes with satisfaction. I was de um, debarrassed of my of interruption. My half-effaced thought instantly revived. So um, Jane's looking out the window and she's thinking she wants she wants change. She's tired of the same old Lowood routine. Um, and she's happy that Miss Grace is snoring, although it normally annoys her, because now it means that Miss Grace will stop talking to her and she can start thinking about this idea that she had, this kind of idea that she was thinking of.